All right. Thank you all so much for tuning in this afternoon to take your mind for a walk at our first virtual mind walk. Um, this is a very exciting series that we're thrilled to be able to participate in. And we have a fantastic presentation for you today. It's called Gardening for Pollinators. And with us, we have Gary Lawson, Karen Rusu and Peggy Burhan. Gary is a graduate of the 2018 UC Master Gardener class. He currently is active in the following Master Gardener committees, membership, docent, public speaking, and is chair of the Succulent Garden. Karen is a graduate of the UC Master Gardener class of 2016. She is currently active on the Master Gardener pollinator team with the Speakers Bureau in the Wildlife Demo Garden. She has also been an active member of the Multiflora Garden Club, National Garden Clubs, Pacific Region of National Garden Clubs, and California Garden Clubs in the Montana de Oro District since 2013. Peggy is a graduate of the 2018 UC Master Gardener class and is chair of the California Native Plant Demonstration Garden, a member of the Master Gardener Education Committee and Public Speakers Bureau. She is also a docent for Pismo State Beach Monarch Butterfly Grove. So I'm gonna turn it over to the team and we hope that you all enjoy this presentation. Okay, uh, this is Gary Lawson. Thanks for that introduction. Let me see if I can get my technological skills up here to start our uh, panel presentation. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Who would have thought that Zoom skills and gardening were going to be used in the same sentence? <laughs> and yet that is a major part of what we're doing now. I say we, the Master Gardener program here in San Luis Obispo County. Uh, we have been running this program for a number of years and have our demonstration garden for which you'll even see some slides. But now that because of the um, pandemic, we're not open to the public in terms of uh, visits to the garden or our uh, presence out in the community. So we're learning now about using uh, Zoom and electro electronic transmission. So let me get my notes up here. Today, the uh, topic we're going to be covering, uh, I'll be talking about some general uh, landscape and gardening techniques for attracting pollinators. Karen will focus on specifically bees, and Peggy's going to talk about butterflies and a few of the pollinator plants. So let's go ahead and move along. I believe we're going to have questions at the end. So if you have any comments or questions, just so, hold those, or you can put them into the chat and uh, we'll address them as we get towards the end. So let's begin with everyone's favorite activity, and that would be a pop quiz. So here you go. On your screen, for you to decide which one of these are pollinators, we have a hummingbird, a lady beetle, a moth, a bat, a honeybee, and a butterfly. So just quiz yourself which ones are pollinators. Don't worry, you won't turn in your answers. If you chose all of these, you would be correct. And in fact, we could add humans and bats to the uh, list of pollinators. I think we humans by accident pollinate a number of plants. And some of us, if we're into hybridizing plants, uh, we certainly will do it mechanically. So in terms of uh, moving on to how do I attract pollinators, the first major step that I would recommend is creating an inventory. You will want to get an idea of what is currently in your garden and several steps to go about making that happen would be spend at least a year or four seasons going around your own garden to see what's blooming, what plants do the pollinators like, all the ones that were listed on the first slide, or any of the desirable insects that you're wanting onto your property. So spend a year or at least four seasons before you go out and spend a lot of money, and you know you can spend a lot of money 
deciding, nope, that ain't going to work there. So get an inventory started. If you don't have any plants that you want to uh, replicate, start walking around the neighborhood just to see which plants are the pollinators frequenting there, which ones are highly visited by the pollinators. You don't even need the net formal botanical name of the plant. Maybe take a photo of it or just say, look, the bees really like the yellow blooming plants. So that will be an idea for you to start working on when you're gonna create your pollinator garden. So walk around the area, around your neighborhood. Um, I would caution if you're gonna walk around with your camera, taking pictures of the neighbor's yards, let them know ahead of time what you're creating is an inventory of what's blooming in the neighborhood. While you're um, walking around or creating your inventory over the year, a concept to be aware of that you'll want to replicate is bloom succession. This is where seeing what's blooming throughout the four seasons will give you a very good idea what you can start planting for near term as well as long term, even for next season. Uh, the pollinators are year round here. So uh, this time of year right now, late winter, early spring, uh, there's not a lot of blooming flowers, but there are quite a few native plants and you'll hear us throughout today's presentation. We definitely have a uh, preference for using native plants. So having uh, an idea of what can be blooming year round is very helpful to the uh, native pollinators. So once you've gotten an inventory, at least started, the next on your checklist will be how to add native plants. Um, it's not that we're saying you, you can't bring in any exotics or non-natives, but trying to get the basis of your garden, at least with some uh, native plants. And we'll be talking about some of those specifically. I, if we have time at the very end, I have a uh, chart from Xerxes Society that we can show you. What are the advantages of using native plants versus exotics? Uh, one is that the native plants will be attracting around four times the number of bees as compared to the exotic plants, the ones that are non-native, and three times as many more butterflies and moths. This is reflecting the fact that the native plants and the native pollinators have co-evolved over the millennia. They know the cycles, they're there to support them for whatever stage of reproduction the uh, pollinators are gonna be using them for. As well as there's some features such as the native bees uh, will be out there and Karen will go into a little more detail on these, but the native bees, they're out there early in the morning and late in the afternoon into the evening, whereas the, uh, the European honeybee, which is what most of us think of as bees, those are not native. Those are not native to the United States. They're certainly in the news right now with the uh, uh, decimation of their population, but those are not native bees. So if you can attract the native bees, those domestic bees, uh, the European honeybees will also be coming in. But anyway, those honeybees, they like it warm, they like it dry. So the native bees are gonna be out there pollinating when it's maybe cool and even wet. So there's a preference to use the native plants. Another is that the native plant will use less, if any, fertilizer. Depending upon where you live, uh, I know Peggy and I just were comparing soil samples recently, and we just live a couple of miles apart here in South County. Uh, but we absolutely live, all, all of us live in microclimates and micro soils here. And even on where you live, I live on the side of a canyon. The top of my hill is pretty much just sand. The bottom over the uh, years, there's a little more loam. So the native plants have learned to survive and thrive in the local soils. So there's really not much of a need to be fertilizing native plants, as well as uh, just to be conscious that over fertilizing, all that fertilizer is gonna wash down into the, uh, uh, the creeks, the arroyos, 
and percolate down to our water systems. In fact, we had our water analyzed here. Again, I live in South County. Like most of us around here, our well waters are uh, tainted with fertilizers and that they suspect from the uh, large agriculture and wine industry. So the natives plants will also use less water. And that is a very big issue for us, certainly here on the Central Coast. I'm assuming most everyone attending today is on the Central Coast. That's a big plus. It's not to say no water, but certainly less water. Uh, in general, a principle will be to water any new plantings for the first year or two until they get established and then they are pretty much on their own and they'll survive with the seasonal rains. Whatever that's going to be, <laughs> the climate is changing. Another advantage on native plants is that they tend to be less invasive. Uh, if you're, it's, it's almost like pulling weeds. The plant that you bring in, if it's from, let's say you love the look of kudzu vines when you were down south and you bring it in here, it's going to take over the telephone poles. It's going to take over your neighbor's lot. Well, the native plants are not as invasive and they're fairly easy to pull up uh, once you do get them established. Another key piece of advice is when you are planting native plants, you will find that if you use something like a four by four, four foot by four foot patch or three foot by three foot patch, you'll be doing the uh, pollinators a big, big favor. Uh, the primary reason for that is that the pollinators, again, have co-evolved with these plants. And if you give them a patch of the same type of plant, it's very uh, economical in terms of energy expended. If they have to go from one plant to a completely different type of plant next to it, I'll anthropomorphize here, but they're thinking, well, how do I get into the pollen here? Where is the nectar? They're spending a lot of time searching the new flower, even though it's sitting next to another one. So using a patch of the same flower and see this could be a bush we'll look at here in a moment. It doesn't have to be actually a, a like an ornamental flower. It could be a bush or a small shrub. Again, if we have time, uh, we'll look at some plants, but I would draw your attention that at the end, we do have a reading list and there's one that is excellent for being able to uh, dial in and get California native plants. And that's from the Xerces Society, X-E-R-C-E-S, Xerces Society. And that book will be on our list at the end. So once you've uh, created your inventory, you have an idea of which plants you want to use and you've attracted the pollinators, the next guidelines will be focusing on using some pollinator friendly landscaping techniques. And you will likely hear from all of us today, the first tip is limit your use of pesticides. The master gardeners, we do adhere to what's called a integrative pest management or IPM, um, using less toxic first as your pesticide control. It could just be mechanical, like washing off with a water hose or learning to live with some of the aphids because the lady bees will be in there eating them up as well as the lacewings. So to limit your use of pesticides, don't go out into a broadcast of uh, pesticides because you're not only killing the undesirable pests, but you're also killing the desirable uh, insects. So moving on will be, um, let me see if I can get my pointer here. Yeah, so uh, this is a shot, hopefully you can see on your screen on the left here. Uh, this is from our demonstration garden in Slow, a example of a butterfly puddle station. It's a bird bath, if you will, that we've put stones and soil into. And a, an attraction for at least butterflies is not only can they get water uh, in addition to from their nectar, but uh, water sources, but they will also be utilizing the uh, 
uh, shallow nature of the stones or the pebbles, as well as they're going to be getting the minerals from the mud. So that puddling is giving them not only water, but minerals that they're going to be using. And on the right here, I don't know what view you're looking at on your screen, but this is a uh, water fountain in my entryway in my home. And I counted 10 bees along the edges of this water fountain. It's kind of a fish pond is what it is. So providing your uh, landscape, your uh, gardening techniques with one, a water, you've done food and now there's water. And then following that, hopefully, is going to be providing an, a, a source of shelter for the pollinators. This is again, a shot from our demonstration garden. Uh, in our wildlife habitat plot. And what I'm demonstrating here is looking at, you want to have different canopy heights. Here are some very tall, I think this is a uh, buckwheat, I'm not sure exact which time, but it's about six feet tall. Uh, the California fuchsia, there's, Peggy, I think this is an Asclepius. Uh, so you want medium, high, and low canopy levels, this will provide a sense of shelter, not only during the breeding season, but uh, uh, during the harvesting or when they're pollinating plants, the pollinators can hide in these uh, different canopy levels, as well as uh, they, well, you, you would want to think about the fourth area is going to be giving them an, a safe area for nesting. And what we're demonstrating here uh, the far right here. This is a bee house. Karen may talk more about this. Uh, it's a house that you can build or buy at your own. Your own, I think, Costco at one point was selling them. Uh, it's a shelter in which you can put bamboo or paper straws in, and the uh, native bees will make their nest in those tubes. In addition, down on the ground, there's a pile of rubble, if you will. Those are some dead twigs and logs. This is perfect for native insects to be burrowing in, as well as a sandbox down in the lower left corner here. Uh, Karen, I think you'll focus on a little bit that the majority of our native bees actually nest in the ground. Not, they're not social bees. They're not like the honeybee and a big nest. So that would be the fourth. Uh, you've got food, water, shelter through the various canopy heights, and then a place for nesting. In addition to some of your plant choices like this um, uh, buckwheat, uh, it's nice to have plants that have a fairly large pithy stem because the insects will bore into that and that's where they're going to bear their young. Even when the plants are beyond their prime good looking, the, uh, the pollinators have already gone inside and that's where they're raising their young. So the next slide should just be a sort of a summary before we hand it over to Karen here. Just some review of some tips, uh, select a diverse number of flower types, as well as across the four seasons. Preference to use native plants and trees. Um, you would want to leave some bare ground for nesting of your bees and avoid the insects, herbicides, <clears throat> and fungicides. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and let Karen take over. Oh, and I, Karen's camera is not working today, so you won't see her face, but hopefully we'll see her PowerPoint slide. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Yep, we can hear you, Karen, and your slides look good. Great. Okay, I'd like to share with you about the solitary native bees. They're important pollinators, pollinating 80% of the world's flowering plants and 75% of the fruits, nuts, and vegetables in the United States. Animals and insects pollinate 98% of vitamin C plants, 70% vitamin A plants, 55% folic acid plants, 
and 74% of lipid plants. There are 20,000 species worldwide of native of bees, 4,000 in the United States and 1,600 in California. Approximately 75% are solitary native bees. Oops, a little quick. Sorry. <laughs> They rarely sting, but they can if they're trapped or stepped on. They do not sting to guard their nest. They don't die when they sting, and their sting is not as strong as a honeybee. Males, actually, they cannot sting. Uh, males are equipped to collect nectar, but they still pollinate quite a bit slower than the females, but they still get it done. And they, may, they can mate more than once without dying. The solitary native bees emerge from their nest fully equipped to get busy. They have two sets of wings. They have an antenna used to touch, taste, and even smell in two different directions. They're capable of flying in light rain, as Gary mentioned. And they have a built-in magnetic sense that acts like a compass to help them navigate. They're turbo pollinators. Bees are also equipped with two eyes, two compound eyes on the sides of their head and three simple eyes on the top of the head. They can see ultraviolet light iridescent and polarized patterns on flowers like little landing strips. Native bees tend to be belly floppers when they pollinate. They move in really fast and they land really hard and then boom, all the pollen is all over their hairy little bodies and they move on to the next one very quickly. The larger carpenter and bumblebees are notorious nectar robbers as you can see in the, in the picture on the far right. Um, since they can't fit inside some of the flowers, they bite the outside of the base of the flower to get the nectar. And sometimes other bees will see them and they'll follow along and get their leftovers. Native bees can't dance, but they can both pollinate. The good news is that these larger bumble and carpenter bees, unlike honeybees, can buzz pollinate the approximate 8% of plants that require buzz pollination. For example, blueberries, cranberries, tomatoes, potatoes, sweet bell peppers, chili peppers, azaleas, and rhododendrons. While many bee species, including honeybees, are generalists who pollinate any native or ornamental flower, they're also specialists who pollinate specific flowers. The hoary squash bees depend entirely on squash and pumpkins for their food source. As in all species, there are the good, the bad, and the bugly. What do you see, a bee or not a bee? The first two pictures are bees. The first one is a mason bee, the next one is a longhorn bee. The last two pictures are actually serpent flies. As you can see, they have large eyes on the front of their head, a short antenna, and only one set of wings. The bad, the pathogens, pesticides, and predators like the yellow jacket and hornets who will eat any insect they catch by chopping them into little bits and carrying them off to their nest. There are cuckoo bees that are nest robbers who lay their eggs in another bee's nest. Then their larvae feed on that larva in the nest and the provisions inside the nest built by a native bee. They aren't very good pollinators since they steal what the other has have collected. And then there are the birds, the spiders, and the skunks. The bugly, assassin bugs, are voracious predators. That's the reddish and yellow one on the left. They inject venom and, and digestive juices into their victims and then take care of them that way. The next one on the right is, are tachinid flies. They parasitize bees, brown beetles, caterpillars, grasshoppers, and earwigs. The adults feed on honeydew pollen and nectar, and they also pollinate. So they're kind of good and bad. So this is going along the same lines as Gary mentioned in his slides, but it's always good to go over it one more time. So if you build it, the pollinators will come. Native bees actually have a 300 foot 
radius, which means they will be pollinating your garden where you have more control over their environment as far as pesticides and what they have available to them. Whereas honeybees, they have a one to five mile radius. So they're going all over. You don't know exactly where they're gonna go to and come back to their hive. So you would like to choose a sunny location. You need to select a variety of non-GMO shrubs, trees, flowers, herbs, and vegetables for the best nutritional value. That's why you would wanna choose the non-GMO. Genetically modified tend to um, have less nutritional value in the plant source for the insects pollinating them. You would like to buy local to avoid bringing foreign and wanted pests or pathogens into your garden from another county. It's suggested that you do buy locally in your own county. You wanna check your zone and make sure you put the right plant in the right place. Overlap your bloom times. Plant the fourth wood patches, as Gary mentioned, of the same variety. You can get a four foot patch from one plant, believe it or not, such as like a ceanothus, you can will grow up to four foot by four foot or, or larger. You just have to read, your, read the plant label and it'll tell you uh, what size your plant will be. Uh, you wanna plant the tallest to the shortest and deadhead regularly to encourage an ongoing bloom. Bees are very attracted to composite flowers from the Asteraceae family, such as these seaside daisies and the common California sunflower. You see these, I know you've seen these along the freeway if you're traveling, you'll see them along the freeway. Uh, they, they really do love the sunflowers. They also love blue. They love hues of blue. Blue flowers are very attractive to bees, like this blue thimble flower. The last three slides I showed you, they were all native plants because, and as well as these, the California desert bluebells and the wild lilac ceanothus. The pot marigold is, is a non-native, but it has been adapted and the bees really do love those. They, they really go for them in my yard. Okay. So as you've seen, native bees love native plants. So they will, they will visit 75 to 100 flowers a day. Native plants have, been, have added benefit of low maintenance, requiring little if any additional fertilizer, and many grow in poor soil and are drought tolerant. A 2003 survey in Berkeley with 1,000 different plant types with 50 natives and 950 non-natives almost 80% of the native plants attracted bees, whereas 8% of non-natives did so, unquote. In addition to the food source, some bees use mud and plant materials to build their nest. You need to also provide a water source, as Gary mentioned, with rocks or corks above the water line, run, um, above the water line because native bees, any bees, they don't swim. So they need a way to get in and out of the water. Um, the running water is most attractive. Uh, however, any source can be used, but you wanna be sure to keep the container clean and regularly replace the water. The female solitary bee builds the nest and cares for her young. So three to four days after mating, the female bee begins nesting. To preserve the species, she, she places the female egg at the back of the nest first, then the males. The males then emerge first, hanging around the nest until the female bees emerge to mate with, with, multiple, to mate with the females multiple times. The female lays the egg, places a pollen ball made of pollen and a little nectar, then plant material, then repeats the tube until the tube is full. You can see that in the picture up there in the, in the right where the leaf cutter bee has cut that perfectly semicircle out of the rose leaf and then they used it and she's used it in her nest there. And she repeats that she'll lay 30 to 40 eggs in her lifetime. Larva feed for about 10 days, pupate inside the nest and emerge fully grown. You can build or buy a bee house. Uh, one thing you can do is 
get a bundle of sticks, about 15 to 20 sticks of reeds or dead hollow stems, such as some asters or raspberries. You want to cut at six to eight inch lengths. One end of hollow stems must be closed, so, that, so you want to cut near the closed stem node or bundle it into a one open sided box with one inch or more overhang for shade. Mount the stems uh, at a horizontal angle inside the box or in the bundle. And if you use paper tubes, be sure they're made for mason bees because plastic or regular paper straws can contain harmful chemical residue for them. Um, you can also use a block of untreated wood and use a 5 16 inch drill bit to drill, hole, drill holes for them, a 3 fourths of an inch apart, 5 to 8 inches deep. Larger than 5 16 will attract spiders instead of bees, and you don't really want bees and spiders to mix if you can help it. Um, the depth of the holes is important, so holes less than a quarter inch should be three to four inches deep, and greater than a quarter inch should be around five eighths inch deep. You want to choose a sheltered spot with the entrance holes facing southeast out of the wind for morning sun exposure. Set it three to five feet off the ground. You can fix the nest firmly to the fence, building, stake, building or a stake or a tree. You can protect the nest from spiders and ants. Um, some people use a, a product called Tanglefoot in, that they put around the base of the post, and that will uh, dissuade the ants and the spiders from crawling up the post. Uh, you can protect it from birds with wire mesh landscape fabric over the holes. Um, uh, nests need to be cleaned or replaced every one to two years. A good source for purchasing nest materials is crownbees.com or Amazon. That's nesting materials. Another cavity nester here, shown here, is the cotton or wool carter bee. Uh, they use plant hairs to make cotton-like balls to make for their nest, you know, they're territorial. So they have earned the nickname head bonkers because they bonk other bees or even run into you to defend their territory. Bees love their Wheaties. They like red buckwheat, like this red buckwheat here. As you can see, there's a cluster of them on this stem right here on the top right in that picture. They're all sleeping there because Native bees, other than the bumblebee, does not go back to their nest to sleep at night. So they rest and they sleep on flower petals, inside flowers sometimes, um, and stems. And uh, some flowers that close up, they will be in there and they'll sleep and you can hear them buzzing in there before the flower opens so they can get out. Um, last but not least, remember to protect our are pollinators and native bees by not using pesticides. However, you must read the label, read the label, read the label. You can use insecticidal soap or horticultural oil before bloom. Uh, be mindful of the time of day you apply it. And again, read the label. And I think uh, Peggy also posted in the chat about the integrated pest management uh, website for you guys to check out. So happy gardening. Thank you for your time and attention. And I'm handing that all right on over to Peggy now. Okay, thank you, Karen. All right. Does everyone see my screen? Yep. Or at least one person <laughs> that can tell me. Hi, everybody. So um, I am Peggy. And just trying to minimize this on here so I can see. Um, we're going to talk about, uh, I'm going to talk about the butterflies. And so um, as a group, Lepidoptera is uh, moss and butterflies. And so there's 160,000 species. So clearly we're not going to talk about all of them, but we're just going to talk about how they are pollinators as well. Um, I think when you think about um, pollination, most people think of bees and butterflies. So that's why we wanted to focus on these two specifically. 
And a lot of you are here and you're familiar with the state park system and you're familiar with the butterfly situation, especially with monarchs. But many insects, as well as butterflies, are experiencing um, a decline. In fact, they say that about 19% in the US of butterflies and, uh, and moths are at risk of becoming extinct. So it's not just our monarch. Um, and for the similar reasons, why? They're losing habitat, we've got climate change, we've got diseases, pesticides that we've talked about, and invasive plants. And also there can be issues with overgrazing and roadside mowing that um, destroys habitat. So whatever we can do as gardeners, that's why as master gardeners, we feel it's so important to try to encourage um, uh, getting insects you know, into our gardens. And sometimes insects is sort of a, a dirty word. A lot of people don't wanna talk about that. So butterflies are beautiful and we know bees are helpful, um, but everything you do for butterflies and bees will help other native insects as well. So, um, oops, let's see. Next slide, there we go. Okay, so how do the Leptodoptera or the moths and butterflies pollinate? And so some uh, butterflies or moths have a very symbiotic relationship, which is a mutually beneficial relationship. Their uh, proboscis matches the shape of the flower. Um, and so they, they really help pollinate those flowers. Um, but pretty much what happens is similar to what happens with the bees, right? The butterfly lands on the flower, it picks up pollen just because it's going in there and it's nectaring, and then it transfers that pollen to another flower that it goes to. So that's another reason why it's so important to have these patches of flowers, because you want to be able to go like, oh, I went from, you know, lavender to lavender as opposed to, you know, lavender to ceanothus. So they, you want them to have a, a cluster where they can really pollinate that one species. Um, and then that's how they transfer the pollen, right? They go from the one flower to the other and they drop off some pollen on the next, um, on the next plant. So um, that's in a nutshell. So if we want to help butterflies and moths, we really have to understand um, their life cycle. So this won't be a long talk about that, but just to know that they all have go through this, right? Where they have an egg, it becomes a larva, it pupates in some way and then emerges as a flying adult. So we want to find a way to support this whole life cycle um, of, the, of the butterflies and moths to attract them to our garden. So two things that they need, when they're caterpillars, they wanna eat. So they're gonna eat food, right? They're gonna eat leaves. And when they're winged adults, they're gonna need nectar. So that's where they're gonna need the flowers. So um, the Xerces Society, which we have already mentioned in this talk, they say that growing the right flowers, shrubs, and trees with an overlapping bloom times is the single most effective course of action to support pollinators from spring through fall. And we'll even extend that. You know, we know with our um, monarchs, they're leaving here in February, and you know, we we need something in bloom in February to to help them along. So. What are butterflies like in your garden? Well, um, for many reasons, they like different varying heights of flowers. So you wanna have, you know, kind of think cottage garden, right? You want some low growing things, some taller growing things. Um, and this gives them a space to hide uh, from predators. They also want a diversity. Now we talked about, yeah, you want a patch of certain things, but there's also, you wanna have diversity because they're different, pollinators and different butterflies like different types of flowers. So you'll attract more variety by having different types of flowers in your yard. And of course they like sun. You frequently will see them out in the sunny parts of your garden more than the shade. Um, if they're gonna stay there for a while, you're gonna want some protection from the wind. So if there's a bank of trees um, in an area uh, where they can uh, hang out and get some protection from the wind. And then of course the water for puddling, which we have talked about already. So everyone can plant nectar, flowers, right? They can be planted everywhere and we can feed our hungry butterflies and not just the monarchs, but other butterflies that are coming through our gardens. Um, they're fueled by that sugary nectar, uh, which the flowers provide. And so we're especially looking for flowers, like Gary talked about, walk around your neighborhood, look at all four seasons. Because right now um, there's not a lot like January, February in bloom. I know my lantana though is still in bloom and some of my cyanothus and my manzanitas are blooming now too, which again speaks to, you know, it's native and non-native. We're not 
promoting like only <laughs> native um, plants, but we do think that it's good to have a little bit of a mix of both. Um, and then this helps with your bloom times as well, because a lot of the cultivars that we grow tend to be uh, flowering mostly in the spring and summertime. So uh, as Gary mentioned too, there's a list um, on Xerces Society. This is just the link to the monarch nectar plants, for example. And so some of the cultivars that, that butterflies really like, I mentioned lantana, but also bee balm and coneflower, black-eyed Susan. And um, as Karen mentioned, things in the Asteraceae family or the sunflower family, which of course includes sunflowers, asters, zinnias, thistles, marigolds, things of that nature will be attractive to your butterflies. And then in terms of native plants that attract them, uh, the manzanitas, uh, fleabane, which is a daisy type flower, yarrow, they really love yarrow, a uh, hummingbird sage and native thistles, and of course the ceanothus uh, buckwheat. They will go to milkweed flowers, um, even though they, milkweed is where the monarchs lay their eggs, uh, they will also nectar on the milkweed flowers. And coyote brush and mule fat have some beautiful blooms uh, that are very attractive to butterflies as well. Again, makes sense to not use insecticides, um, but we, I, we always like to reiterate that, that um, that really, um, people sometimes are, you know, it's a setting, right? You go out and you look on your plant and there's all these aphids and you think, ah, I wanna get rid of the aphids. But if you wait long enough, um, the ladybugs come by, the lace wings, the parasitic wasps, and um, they eat the um, aphids. And if I get um, uh, impatient, I sometimes just um, knock off, you know, a bunch of aphids um, <laughs> to get rid of them or wash them off with some um, water too, as well as a strong spray of water. So caterpillars. So the the butterfly is going to lay her eggs on a plant. This is an example of a monarch caterpillar in this picture um, laying an egg on a narrow leaf milkweed. Um, but other caterpillars, um, or sorry, other butterflies do this on whatever their host plant is. So the upsetting thing for some gardeners, and for me, it happened to me too before I was a master gardener and before I knew all about milkweed, <laughs> is that the caterpillar ate my whole plant. And I was very upset about that. So um, once you learn that this is part of the life cycle um, and uh, that's what they're supposed to do, they're supposed to eat their, your milkweed, um, then you can um, kind of uh, go with that, right? Um, it's fun to watch. Uh, there's non-natives uh, that attract butterflies as well, like passion vine, um, fennel, snapdragons even, um, and then some natives I have listed down here. And they're all specific to different species. And a book that I hope you guys, I don't know if you can see my picture still, but I have this in the, um, in the reading list as well. It's called um, Introduction to Southern California Butterflies. And even though we're not in Southern California, um, you know, many of the butterflies are the same. And if you open up the um, and find a butterfly that you're interested in, it will tell you what the food plant is and the food plant means for the caterpillar and then what the nectar. So I just happened to open up the Akron blue and the food plant is deerweed, which is a native plant and the nectar um, and they nectar on buckwheat. Doesn't mean they don't nectar on anything else, but then it will give you an idea. Hey, I wanna attract blue butterflies to my garden. Maybe I'll plant more buckwheat um, and more deerweed to attract that. So just to give you some ideas about that. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, um, you can plant milkweed if you wanna help the butterflies and you can plant nectar. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that and we're gonna talk a little bit about milkweed. So milkweed, uh, is where the monarchs will lay their eggs, but the Xerces Society recommends that we only plant it here on the central coast where they overwinter if we live at least five miles from those overwintering sites. So if you're living right in Pismo or Grover, um, they think that that could break their diapause and diapause is their uh, pausing of the reproductive um, uh, system so that they they wait to breed. Um, so we try to encourage people not to plant milkweed too close to the overwintering sites. And then we try to encourage native milkweed. And I'll talk a little bit about a few of the native milkweeds. Um, and specifically, I have pictures of each one, but specifically this Areocarpa and the Californica, they are earlier emergers. So they'll start to um, come up earlier in the season um, than some of the others. The tropical milkweed we don't recommend because it harbors a parasite 
called Ophryrocystis electroscuria or OE. And we recommend that if you have it, um, that you either replace it with the native or cut it back in October, November so that and remove that completely, throw it out the clippings so that the parasite um, doesn't stay in your garden and damage the butterflies. So here's a couple examples. Um, narrow leaf milkweed um, has narrow leaves, as you can see, and it has a white bloom. It grows very well here um, in the central coast. It will grow by runners and by seed. So, and, and actually most of them will grow by runners and seed, but this one specifically can be a little bit invasive. So you wanna put it somewhere where you're, you're fine with it taking over a little patch of land um, and uh, growing by runners and popping up. Uh, showy milkweed, you see it has a much broader, uh, softer, wider leaf, and it has a pink flower. Um, it uh, does uh, grow by runners as well, but not as strongly as the narrow leaf. Uh, a couple other that you don't see very often and you don't see often in the stores. Um, Asclepius areocarpa, or Indian, milk meat, uh, Indian milkweed, also called woolly pod milkweed or cotolo milkweed. It has a ton of names. And it's confusing because the Asclepius vestita is also called woolly milkweed. And you see the, um, the leaves of both of them are kind of woolly and fuzzy, um, but the uh, areocarpa has a white flower and the vestita has a yellow flower. All of these are native to um, San Luis Obispo County and could be grown here. Some of them like certain habitats, so they might be harder to grow in certain areas. And then California milkweed, um, again, not one that you see very often. I'm just starting to propagate this. I bought some seeds and I'm hoping um, that it's gonna do well. Um, it's another one of the earlier emerging uh, milkweeds. So I'm excited to try to see um, how that grows here. And then again, the um, native milkweed, we really want to try to discourage people from growing the, the, nat the non-native, sorry, the non-native milkweed or the Asclepius carasavica. So um, we usually have a, a third person, or sorry, a fourth person in our group who helps us um, with our program, and he is an entomologist. So he couldn't be here today. So I do wanna show some of his slides because um, I think we're all pretty good with like, okay, bees and Karen showed you there's some bees that don't really look like bees uh, that are helping us out. But there's also some other pollinators that don't look like bees or butterflies. And we don't wanna kill them because they're helping us pollinate our gardens. And one is the green lacewing and it is, um, so I want to thank Norm Smith, I forgot to mention his name, our entomologist, for helping us with these slides. This will eat aphids too, so it's a great bug to have around. Um, if you have them in your garden, you want to encourage them to stay. And um, then, um, whoops, cursor. This is the, um, the surface fly that Karen also talked about, but it pollinates too. So these are just to show you some other pollinators that um, might be in your yard. There's the surfed fly actually nectaring. It's beautiful, isn't it? And you can see this picture where, how Karen mentioned, it only has one set of wings versus the bees having two. And here's the tachnid fly, often seen on flowers. This is a really interesting, um, the um, thread-waisted wasp. Um, but it can also predate, you know, there's good news, bad news. It's helping us pollinate, but can also predate on some of the, uh, the caterpillars. So um, it's, a hard, it's hard to be a naturalist and to love all the things in your garden because some of the things you love eat other things that you love. <laughs> um, here's a mud dauber on a nest. They can also help us uh, pollinate. Um, the crabonine wasp doesn't even really look like a wasp, right? It kind of looks like a bee. Uh, also can predate caterpillars. Here's another little small wasp that, um, this is the great one that comes and eats those aphids and thrips. So, but it also is pollinating while it's out there. Um, so trying to attract these guys to our garden is really great. The tarantula hawk um, also goes on fe feeding on nectar and um, moving pollen around as it does that too. 
and spider wasps. Now, this is Norm's slide, so of course he's calling it handsome. So I, <laughs> it's handsome to an entomologist. So here's this kind of scary looking um, spider wasp. It does eat spiders um, as well. Oh, there he is, eating a spider, attacking a, um, a spider. And then the um, scoliad wasps, uh, they also pollinate, and even yellow jackets. So pretty much anything that's going to your nectar can help. Um, to pollinate some of your plants, um, even the California paper wasp, and then some other very, very small, small um, predatory wasps that, again, predatory meaning it's attacking other um, normally things that we don't like on, a, on our plants, like some of the aphids and thrips. Um, some species that we talked about, so here's a um, uh, buckwheat series, there's several, there's many different kinds of buckwheat. Uh, there's a very large one with the white flowers, um, Ergonum uh, fascicularis, uh, fascicularum, and then there's another small, very small yellow uh, buckwheat too. So there's a, quite a variety of buckwheats that could be planted that will attract butterflies. Ceanothus can get very large um, and be covered with bees. Um, these, uh, there's also many, many varieties. There's slow growing ceanothus. Um, there's sort of a trailing ceanothus. You can get many different cultivars um, and they all attract, um, a, lot, a lot of them attract the bumblebees too. You see quite a few bumblebees on ceanothus. Um, some non-native plants that I love in my yard, this is mint and rosemary. And right now, that's another thing that's in bloom right now is the rosemary and it is covered uh, with bees. And of course, when the mints in bloom later in the summer, uh, it attracts a lot of pollinators. Yarrow, yarrow comes in several colors. There's a, there's yellow, pink, uh, and white, and very good for pollinators. That's a native species. Um, and the toyan is also native, also called Christmas berry. Um, will attract pollinators. Um, it's not in bloom right now. It blooms in the late summer. And then this is one from Norm's yard, the variegated um, Unonymous. And he said, I thought that this was a plant that looked like, you know, barely flowers. You see this little teeny, teeny flower. And he says that he has seen more variety of pollinators on this plant. Um, and of course he knows, he goes out there and he knows what all these are. <laughs> so he's um, a, an expert, I take his word on that. So even if you have something like this, that looks like it's barely in bloom, um, it is attracting pollinators to your yard as well. Uh, here's a Palo Verde tree. If anyone has one of these, you know that when they're in bloom, uh, they're really humming uh, with bees as well. So we'll, um, this is kind of our summary slide to um, reiterate the things that um, all of us talked about, um, just to kind of uh, remind you of kind of the key factors in attracting uh, pollinators to your website, I'm sorry, to your website, to your garden, <laughs> looking at the website. Um, and then um, here's our reading list as well. So uh, we talked about um, the Southern California gardening um, butterfly book. And then here's the Xerxes Society book that we talked about too, is um, attracting native pollinators. So pretty much, you know, like everything you need to know about attracting pollinators to your yard. Um, this is a great book as well as some of the other reading uh, that we have listed here. So I can leave that up for a while um, while we talk and take questions. I think there's probably a few in the chat. So um, Mallory, I don't know, do you want us to um, yeah. just go ahead and read from the chat or do you want to? Or how yeah, I can. I'll, uh, I'll pull the questions. I'll read the questions out loud to you all. Um, we had one come in earlier in the Q&A. Uh, where do you recommend we purchase these native plants? Um, I could probably take that one. Um, there's a lot of uh, places for um, native plant purchase. Um, there's a very large native plant nursery up in um, Santa Margarita called Las Palitas. Um, that has quite a few native plants. Um, locally, you can even get them at some of the local garden centers and some um, 
Uh, even big box stores will sell some native plants. I will caution you about the milkweed though. Most of the milkweed that you find at chain stores is the non-native milkweed and um, you may have to source um, a native plant nursery. Also growing grounds, which is in San Luis Obispo and uh, they support, um, uh, forgot exactly what the organization is, but it's not for profit and they plant, um, uh, they have a lot of native plants there as well. Um, Native Sons is um, in our area, but I think they mostly are wholesale and um, maybe once a year they have a, uh, a sale that they open to the public. Gary, do you have other? Uh, yeah, someone just posted that the California Native Plant Society will be having okay. their drive-through, online drive pickup, and they have a wonderful selection. So that's California Native Plant Society. Also, just a, uh, a word of caution, not that Las Palitas, go and visit their website. It's very, very uh, thorough. However, Penny is kind of slammed with the uh, pandemic. Her response to any emails is that she's got 4,000 in, in her basket. So <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's a little overwhelmed, but their website, her website is incredible. It gives you ideas of what to go out and look for. Um, Actually, we don't have any connection with any of the um, retail outlets, but miners in Morrill Bay, I have found carries a nice selection, specifically of Annie's Annuals, which is an organ, uh, a nursery up in Richmond, East Bay, and they carry a lot of her, uh, not just native plants, but a number of other called Annie's Annuals. Mm -hmm. um, also, someone would was mentioning the um, uh, where to go. If you want to look for types, the uh, botanical garden here in Slow, oh, right. they will mm -hmm. have some, as well as down in Napomo. Napomo has a native garden just off of Pomeroy. And you could go and see what's currently planted in native kind of habitat situations. Um, also at the book, the Xerxes Society, uh, has you can go to their website and pull down again a chart that lists a, a wide range of native plants that would work here on the central coast. I will also mention there's a great website called calscape.org and if you go to calscape and you're looking for um, a native plant you type in the name of the plant it will tell you uh, nurseries that carry it. Now in my experience you still have to call them to see if they really are still carrying it um, but that's another good way to find uh, nurseries because some nurseries, they may not be specifically native plant nurseries, but they may carry a native plant. Great. Um, I see a question. Someone wants to know, is Los Osos far enough away from the wintering sites, that five mile guideline, Peggy, do you know? I mean, they're on the coast. I would probably say that Los Osos is a little too close. Yeah. I mean, I, this is what Xerces is recommending. I know there's milkweed everywhere in people's yards <laughs> that we're not going to, you know, um, be able to tell people what to plant in their yards, but um, this is what their recommendation is. Yeah, the, the butterflies do overwinter the coast of California, um, pretty much from uh, sites in Mendocino all the way down to Baja, California. And someone submitted a question from Facebook. Uh, Hello, you can make a plate to attract bees. I'm, I plate, I'm not sure what that means. How do you do that? What are the things I need? Does Karen or Peggy do, or the person on Facebook, can you repost? Yeah, yeah. Um, when you look back at the slides, if you, if you look back, you'll be able I can, to I I can go back. To build a bee a bee nest, if you want to build one. You can buy one. Uh, my caution is that if you buy one, sometimes the holes are the wrong size and the also the tubes are stationary, so you can't really clean them. So you would need to get paper, uh, paper tubes for mason bees specifically or for native bees to insert in those holes so that you can keep that nest clean unless you only want to use it for one season. Um, if you want to build one, you need like a block of untreated wood, and then you would drill five sixteenths inch and lower and smaller holes in it 
to imitate what the bark, be what the beetles um, do in nature to the um, wood. And then that's what you need. You need that. And then you would, you would mount that on a tree or a post south uh, facing southeast out of the wind. And then you make sure that there's about a one inch or more cover over it for shade. And um, that's pretty much it. Make sure you okay. keep it clean. Make sure you have water source available. If you're attracting mason bees, they have to have mud. So make sure there's a little bit of mud not far from their nesting block there. And that's about it. It's not really difficult. Okay. Um, uh, UC Davis Hagen Dawes Honeybee Farm is also doing a YouTube video on how to build these these bee nests. So you can go online and check that out at Hagen Dawes. Um, Do they give you ice cream with that? No. <laughs> the reason they named it Hagen Dawes was that Hagen Dawes needed the money to build that garden. Ah, beautiful. Yeah. 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 And I visited that garden, and it's really very very nice. And there's people there that can uh, help you with questions about it. And they have native bee nests there it's for you to observe. And a lot of the flowers and plants that they like are there in that garden. If you want uh, to. Try to if we it. have time, uh, I can put up that chart. Oh, yeah. Uh, so hopefully everybody can see this is a chart that you can download from Xerxes. But just to give you an idea, when you go out looking for your uh, plants, uh, some aspects to think about. Uh, are, what season do they bloom in? Are they early, mid, early, mid, mid season, late? So just to give you some of the common names of the plants here, this would be the botanical name. You'll get an idea, are they an annual? Are they a perennial? What color are they? And then there's some notes over here in terms of uh, what type of uh, pollinators are going to attract and some uh, specific information. So when you go out looking, I'm not aware of any of the nurseries that have a real designated area on native plants. They'll, they're going to be mixed in there. Like someone was saying, Annie's Annual usually has their own little, uh, some shelves that they have out there, but those are not all natives anyway. But these would be the factors to look at. Uh, what is their blooming uh, season? Uh, what colors are they if you're going to go attracting different types of pollinators? So these would be the things to look at in general when you're out there deciding what's on sale. So just wanted to throw that. Again, you can get that th through the uh, Xerxes book or their website, and it's free. All right, so I think we're at the hour and um, I don't yeah. see any other questions coming in. Do you wanna close this out, Mallory? Yeah. Listen, I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much, Piggy, Karen, and Gary. This was an amazing presentation and um, the chat was so active. I can tell everyone really enjoyed it. Um, we're all really engaged. Thank you very much for your time. And okay, you're welcome. And thank you to all the people who put in their comments on the chat. Yeah. Um, I'm going to share my screen as we're saying goodbye to everyone. Um, if you would like to tune into future virtual mind walks, please visit the schedule of events um, at, on the centralcoastparks.org website. Um, that's the Central Coast State Parks Association. And there you can view all the exciting mind walks that we have lined up, plus um, additional events and programming through your Central Coast State Parks. Thank you so much, everybody, and have a great rest of your day.